Assalamu alaikum. Akhlam wa salan. How are we all? Yeah, thumbs up from the corner over there. How about over here? Enjoying the day so far? Been brilliant? Having a wonderful time? Good. Well, I appreciate you all sticking around and joining us on this really fascinating conversation because I promise you, these guys are absolutely fabulous. Guys and women, I should say. And thank you to all of you for being here. How are we? Good. Yeah? Excellent. Perfect. Lovely. So I wanted to start with something a little bit different. We're obviously all professionals in sports, but the reason we're in sport is because we're fans. At our core, we love the sport, and we've experienced sport in so many different ways. So Mike in here actually put out a post on LinkedIn that I just loved and was really inspired by, and I wanted to start by a question that she actually posed, which is, what do we love about fan experience at stadiums? So that's exactly what I want to ask all of you. I'm going to throw it back to you. Okay. So just a quick one. I think uh, being in stadiums uh, throughout my life many, many times, it is when I can be in a space, a section at the stadium where I can feel the people around me and just that energy of being together with strangers, celebrating. Like right you know, now, right? <laughs> just, just, yeah, where you just kind of suddenly, you know, there's a moment that is amazing and your whole body just jumps up, you know, sy synchronizing with everybody else. And so I think that just that feeling of having that that joy together. It can also, of course, be pain if you, your team is, <laughs> is losing, but the joy of it. Yeah. What about for you, Leo? Yeah, so for, for me, I was lucky enough to be in Paris Olympic Games and the, uh, in all of the different stadia, I was providing the commentary for my sport, which is diving. So I've been very lucky to be on the other side. So all the fans cheering me and other athletes on. So I know what it's like to receive that adulation and joy. And now I've always been a sports fan and since retiring from my Olympic uh, adventure to be in all the different stadium to be part of that atmosphere is is incredible but of course the Paris Olympic Games you know was full um, as it should be mm. all the fans were there of course the Tokyo Olympic Games completely different experience so looking at the two yeah. most magical things that were missing right was the fans and speaking to the athletes who I mentor many at the Tokyo Games just to be in empty stadia mm. was really unrewarding and unfulfilling even though they were doing the sport that they love so the fans play such an important part to make it whole they're the glue that hold it all together because it would be a lonely experience if you didn't have the chance to perform as an athlete in front of the fans whichever sport you're doing so for me in the Stade de France in Paris watching the track and field over 200 countries represented the whole place is going absolutely crazy <laughs> for every athlete that's going and there's nowhere more exciting or alive than than a stadium that's going off like that so just a few months ago and I'm almost going there now talking about it you're bringing us back to it it really sure. does feel as though we're kind of there you can feel it you yeah, can sense yeah. it can't you I love yeah. it what about for you Mimi I think what, what Leon's saying it's very similar in fact all of us saying the same thing it's about a feeling mm. because probably being a, in a stadium is the most epic of human narratives that you will ever find at any mm. other point you probably get close in an event like this you know, where, there's, where you start to bring people together. Mm. But when you're in a stadium and there is that human reality of success and failure and loss and strength and courage and the things that make us human, mm -hmm. and then you expand on that by tens and tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of people in tune with each other, I think that's why we talk about feeling mm. and why you hear my, my colleagues on the stage talking about how it feels. It's somatic. Yeah. It's not just the experience of the sport, but it's how you actually feel absorbing it. So for me, all of my memories are, are almost sensorial memories. Mm. How it felt to be surrounded by people in a shared moment, whether it's a win or a loss, that's a, that's a very unique reality in a stadium. There's something so powerful about energy and about so vibes cool. and the way that people can flow in that kind of experience, isn't it? I mean, it, it really is quite something. What about for you, Wes? Well, um, it is in, it's interesting because I was telling Megan uh, before about the feeling that I had when I was just a kid, you know, and this feeling remains. I mean, I still have that passion and I still have that um, willing to, to see people having fun 
uh, hugging each other, even though they don't know each other, mm -hmm. you know, in a stadium. So it's something that I enjoy, and I have the luck to work with. Mm -hmm. So that's why I keep doing this. <laughs> <laughs> and long may it continue, yeah. for the benefit of every sports fan out there. <laughs> yeah. Now, I want to go back to a point that you mentioned about inclusion, about inclusivity. You are a leader when it comes to social change via sport. So what are some of the ways in which stadiums, environments can bring about a sense of community, inclusivity, and collectiveness? Well, um, it was really good. I don't know if you all heard Jens Lehmann told earlier, he was just mentioning uh, one of the stadiums that he would like to come back and visit here that is going to be built now for the uh, 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 2034 World Cup, if, you know, if they win it, but that's the, the, <laughs> the plan where they are, there's only audience uh, on three sides and then you watch the mountains in the back. So I think if I take the perspective of women and women's mm -hmm. fans, and I'll say that right now there is 684 million female fans in the world. We are really growing. And out of those millions, I think 72% of those fans, they are mega fans. They are super mm -hmm. fans of sports. So there's a huge potential. Only 22% of them go to stadiums. They watch at home, right? So I think that there's something in that space of saying the stadiums be sustainable, but not only just for people, but for the world that we are living in, right? That they are built the best way, that they are, you know, catering to our needs and our... our and, and it's a difficult challenge because... Mm. A stadium can also almost be like sitting in an airplane, right? You're a little too tight with everybody. <laughs> you know, it's like maybe the film is good and maybe it's not, and maybe the game is good, and maybe it's not, right? But but then then it takes that effort for the stadium, for the teams, the games to actually give us a, a agency to own a little bit, like own the stadiums, right? So so I will say that that if stadiums really tell the story about their sustainable way of how they are building and, and why they're building, why they're doing all the things about the community work. What Thomas from Lekia was talking about before, right? We're doing a stadium city, or, or um, what was a champion city, right? Where we, we have people living there and everybody have access to sports. Uh, and then uh, start thinking about the, sex, the sections at stadium, right? So I, I would say a huge, part of the stadium could be about our mental well-being. Mm. So when you book your tickets, then you know that if you book your ticket in this stadium, it is about us yeah. being because together. You know, and it's, it's also about sure. you know, re connecting and, and, and being together for the well-being of us. I would really like yeah, right. to continue that conversation actually Sorry. with Leon. Mm -hmm. No, because yeah. you are obviously a mental health yeah. expert. And this is something yeah. that yeah. has been, I think, lacking for so many years. We've never really looked at that component of human nature and, mm -hmm. and how we can actually adapt that to the world of sports. And it, it's so incredibly important. So how do we actually do that now, looking ahead to sure. the development of stadiums? Yeah, so I think that um, lots of people or fans would find going to a stadia or stadium or sports complex a very um, almost an overwhelming or potentially overwhelming situation will I be safe will I get there okay how's the transport is it okay for family what do I go if I'm feeling overwhelmed and at the moment it's kind of fit for purpose isn't it you mm. go in it's almost gladiatorial in its setup you've got the action and then there's nowhere to retreat to there's no kind of guiding hey it's okay if you know you've you know you're feeling overwhelmed or there's anything like this so the i think there's a element of design phase there's this wonderful um, expression biophilic design where we can make things and um, with architecture using very natural flowing spaces with plants and what we're seeing here in the mm. design is just a lot of the uh, presentations we were just treated to showing the green spaces and how much more welcoming that is and that sense of of ease can cause people to feel a little calmer when they arrive. Of course, the sport is a celebration of an intense action, but you also want to make sure that people are okay. And by creating those spaces through design and also by mm. safeguarding, so psychological safety is a massively important thing, training in first aid and psychological first aid to, to ensure people are feeling a sense of welcomeness, of safety and of ease. That's going to create a lovely welcoming environment. Maybe more of the fans who are a little bit apprehensive to attend mm. some of the stadium mm. will feel more inspired and welcome. And I think the, the stadiums can almost be um, just 
just one, just for one use. Whereas we saw in some of the slides there, you can utilize them for, you know, for I, I swim at the Olympic pool in Stratford, in lane four, where, you know, all of the amazing <laughs> athletes, and I'm not a swimmer, I'm a diver, right? So I'm paddling up and down, but this is where Olympic, world, Olympic and world records were, and the utilization of that facility is incredible. So can we do that mm. more with the stadiums and the, and the things for the future? Because people will connect more deeply to it, feel easier about going there, and they go and watch the big, intense competitions, boxing fights, or whatever mm. it is. So I feel that there's an education to be done as well in encouraging people to come in and join and know how they'll be held in these spaces. Oh, that's so excellent. And there's so many things I want to extrapolate from what you just said, but the first thing I want to start with actually leads me to you, Mimi, because yeah. you work at a at a company that actually designs a lot of the things that Leon here is talking about. You have a fascinating role. I know that you're an expert when it comes to empathy, mm -hmm. which is something also, I think, quite new to the sports world when it comes to the overall structure of how we want to design stadiums and spaces like he was talking about. So how do you actually factor that in whenever you are trying to create an overall memorable, safe fan experience? Because it's no longer just about sustainability, mm -hmm. um, creativity, innovation, all that kind yeah. of stuff. There's so much more to it as well. There is, but I think the thing with empathetic design is that it has to start with the people. And I know that sounds obvious, but for many decades, design of stadiums and spaces was probably firstly about the players, and maybe it should be, right? They have to play. Um, and secondarily, about the business reality around that. And only very recently have we started to really think about the fans and how they experience it. Because, of course, experience of any interior or exterior space is an extremely personal experience. You know, like Leon was saying there, people go to stadiums for very different reasons. Some people want to be right on the edge by the noise, by the action, where they could get hit by a ball at any minute. And for many people like me, I like to be there, but I don't, I don't want to be there, right? I want to be somewhere else. So empathic design and, and what we call spatial storytelling is that ability to look at a space and understand how to use it for individuals. Mm. And again, it sounds obvious, but it's actually very new. You know, we have boardrooms of people all around the world talking to each other about what they think mm. their fans want. Mm. And I think one of the key parts of that is to say, but have you asked them? Yeah, exactly. Have you how actually you asked that your gap, fans? Right? You build exactly, that you know, to Leon's point, how much grass do they want? How do they want to feel when they enter? Do they need another burger bar? Or would you they have some fans here, else? do you want to ask them? Yeah, you should. We could do like dipstick research live. But yeah, I think it starts with listening. I think brilliant mm. interior design starts with knowing the people you're designing for. And of course, mm. that's quite a lot of people in a, in a stadium. I love that. And again, there's something else I want to come back to later on sure. uh, as to what you were just talking about there. But Wes, we have to talk about major events. Yeah. The Copa America recently in the United States. And I'm actually from the States originally. I can attest to the fact that football, soccer, we've never really been that great of a nation when it comes at least to the men's side of things. The women, we've been fantastic for many years mm -hmm. now. But overall, as a fan base, we've never really followed the sport itself. So in some ways, I wonder if there's any parallels with what's happening here in Saudi Arabia, looking ahead to potentially hosting the World Cup in 10 years' time, and the growth that the United States in particular has been experiencing and learning how to host these major events and learning how to create a wider fan base and interest in football in particular. Some of the challenges you faced, some of the things that you actually yeah. have seen and how they can implement it for a wonderful, oh, sorry, <laughs> what a fun <laughs> experience here uh, in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, I apologize. I didn't greet you. Good evening. Uh, such a pleasure to, to be here talking to you guys. Well, let's talk about an experience then. Uh, the Copa America in the US was a very interesting event um, for many different aspects. Um, every time I am working for a major sport event, I take the opportunity to talk to people, okay. not only to the fans, but I talk to the suppliers, to the, to the staff, and everyone who is involved, and when I have time for that. And it was interesting because on my first stadium there in the US, I was, I was responsible for the West Coast there, the Copa America in marketing rights deliveries. So the first stadium was the Levi's Stadium uh, from 49ers. And I had the chance to talk to, to different functional areas there, different people. And it was very 
like more than interesting. They, they basically, they, they, the main site was everything we do here is focused on fans, everything. So uh, I'm saying this because obviously it's important to have a great technology behind, it's awesome to get an amazing stadium, but we have to have people working, thinking with the same goal. So uh, I realized that uh, in every single functional area, and every, again, everything was going on the same direction. But obviously, uh, a part of it, uh, as, you, as you know, uh, the technology there is something very special for the experience in the US. So I could mention, obviously, uh, those giant screens, uh, HK mm. uh, connectivity for everyone. But again, we have to, to, to have the, the same goal, think on the same direction to make those things work. Um, and I mean, I, 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 if I start to this topic at this moment, I probably will, <laughs> will cover <laughs> the, 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 the whole okay. panel. But I think this is the, the main the main aspect of uh, for this answer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to take that and I'm going to run with it because okay. I want to throw a little bit of a curveball at you potentially. VAR. Who loves VAR here? Okay, no. <laughs> exactly. Most people don't like VAR, right? It takes too long. There you go. It has been a source of massive debate, and it's one in which fans all around the world want to have an opinion on and get involved in and have a say on, right? And it's something that certainly happens a lot at the stadiums themselves. <laughs> so how is it that we can implement technology in a better way, not just for fans, but also for for managers, for coaches, for, for players, for athletes, for whatever it may be, in order to make it a more enhanced experience all around for everyone. Yeah, it's, uh, it's super interesting. I mean, I was looking at some elite, so to speak, youth players, and, and you know, by the age of 11, their entire life is data <laughs> fixed, right? <laughs> so it's like, wow, that's a little creepy that everybody knows everything they do. Um, but I think it's there, there's, uh, there's there's so many positive things that could come that could come out of it. But I think we need to, as people, we we have to learn in a sense to be in the the difficult situations. Like as a player, you know, you score a goal and then we're just gonna check for VAR. You know? It's like <laughs> and you just you know, everything emotionally in you just goes Absolutely. like. I'm gonna smile. I'm gonna freeze. I'm gonna. What am I gonna do, right? Hold and, my and the same, the same, <laughs> the same with fans. Fans feel like we're just gonna keep saying that we're winning, right? Because, because maybe that will affect the people that. Mm. So we are. We are still in a sense inexperienced mm. in how to be in the unpleasant situations in life in general. I mean, and that reflects also when we have something like that that takes. You know, as you say, it takes too long for us to get there. But then. If it takes that long, how do we how do we learn to be in in uh, that space? And and then I think that there's maybe also something about technology to develop technology that is not just about uh, making the experience more correct, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that is about the competition. There could maybe be also other ways of looking at if we're talking about mental health and empathy. Could there be other ways of uh, tracking? What goes on in the players? Do we connect with that as fans? You know, uh, can all our fans, can all our data be used as a, as a now we are, we are, we are following and feeling in love. We are in love with our team, right? Mm. And and they can say that. Look at that in data and in numbers, right? So there's maybe not just what happens on the field, mm. but what happens with us as as fans and mm. and and audience. And that brings knowledge. I think for most people who doesn't necessarily know what goes on inside the stadium is that it's much better to know, you know, that when you, again, when you buy your ticket, when you walk in the door, that you have a sense of what is, what is the space right here, right? So building, ways, building more data around the fans that is for the fans, by the fans and stuff like this, I think would be interesting. And one of the ways in which this is actually happening right now, I'm sure everybody here has a phone, right? And when you go to stadiums and you go to experience sporting events, what do you do? You take out your phone, you take a photo, you take a video, you share it with the world. And that really has changed the way in which sports has been consumed, the way it's been covered, because now you have something in your pocket 
that anybody can use to have their own voice, to have a narrative, to share storytelling with. And it kind of goes back to what you were saying before about how spaces are actually used in stadiums and, and how it's actually broken the mold with traditional forms of media. Now anybody can actually be a form of media. <laughs> So what are the ways in which that can actually carry on improving or, or developing or changing the use of social media in particular, do you think? I, th I think often when we look at technology, we're talking to ourselves a little bit, as in you know, people are developing pieces of tech or virtual reality or AI or whatever it is because it's cool, because it's fun. And there is a role for that. There's a role for cool, fun stuff. But if you look at what makes up engagement in a stadium or in a sport, I would say there's probably three things. There's social identity. So how do I feel? How do I fit in? How does that represent who I am as an Arsenal supporter, for example? There's belonging. So who am I as part of these people together in this moment for this goal? And then there's a sense of achievement. So for me, if we look just at those three, that is where the technology should be innovating in enhancing those human realities, right? Whether that is my identity, my belonging, or that sense of winning and growth that makes us human. Because as human beings, we have to grow to thrive. Yeah. We don't do well when we're stagnant. So I, I'm all for tech and, and social. People always ask me, is social media and technology stealing our empathy? Is it ruining our form of connectivity? And I'm quite protective of social media, and I always say no. Of course, there are times when if we all sit on our phones, we wouldn't talk, we would disconnect. But in the end, it's how we use those channels to create that fan connection and experience, which I think will distinguish the great from the good. I see Wes over there nodding along in agreement. Totally nodding, agree. are you nodding? Totally oh, agree. good, we can be friends. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> Anything you want to add to that in particular? Uh, Actually, I, I was thinking about Disney World, for example. Disney World? Yeah. Oh, I think for sports, with an experience, this is the best benchmarking, you know? Obviously, we can look at, I don't know, Arsenal, Real Madrid, Sao Paulo, my club in Brazil, and they all have a certain type of fan experience. But the ultimate fan experience is the Disney World. So Disney World basically amazes their fans, their clients, mm. every single day, every day of the year, you know? And... Uh, it's the happiest this, place on earth for a reason, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> At least that's what they say. Exactly. So that, that, that's my point. And I, if we know how to use those technologies, uh, again, with my first answer, that's the perfect match. Okay. I yeah. like it. Mm -hmm. I like it. Um, talking about technology and its use, at least here in Saudi Arabia in particular. I imagine many people here feel very proud of all of the sporting events that they've been hosting and the growth that is to come and all of the other major events that are going to be hosted here in due course. So what is it that technology can do in order to help with the overall fan experience for people to walk away and have that kind of feeling of, I just had the best day of my life at Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that's a really good question. So um, I would say, first of all, uh, it's, it's on hype, but is there uh, artificial intelligence at this moment? Mm. So, but I would say, first, I am assuming that we, as a company here, we are collecting and uh, treating that data in the best way possible. Because nowadays we have the IoT, Internet of Things. So we have so many possibilities to collect data uh, everywhere from our clients, our fans, our customers. So once we are doing that correctly, we have different tools to use though, that data in order to, to offer different solutions in terms of security, in terms of experience. Like, I think uh, our goal should be, we have to offer things to our clients, when, where, how, and what exactly they want. But how can we get this information from data? We, we have, well, obviously, uh, observing the, um, the security, uh, I forgot the, the, the the word now, but observing uh, the, the security on, on data, 
we have to, to understand the entire fund journey. So once, once we get that, great. So this is the first point, this is the basis, you know? Because we cannot go to the next step if we are not even able to check this box. We right. need to understand them. Once we understand that, we can go and talk about AR, for example. AR, for me, is great, augmented reality. So uh, once we accept that we as spectators, we interact with our favorite sports with a phone in our hands. So we have at least a second screen. Sometimes we have a third screen as well. Yeah. So uh, maybe there are many people that don't like that. But this is the reality. It's not only about the Gen Z. There are so many people doing the same thing. So once we accept that, we need to take advantage of it. You know. So for example, you are in the stadium. And I can offer it for you, I don't know, Samra, uh, I know, we know you like popcorn and, and, I don't know, soda, because we know that you bought that last, last time you, you've been here. So we are offering to you a combo uh, with 50% off. It's a you personalized just, experience. Exactly. Yeah. So we just need to follow the arrows on your phone. So you point your phone and you go through the stadium and you follow and you find uh, the, the discount. Also, you can point your phone to a player and see the, the, his stats, for yeah. example. You know? There are so many possibilities, so many possibilities uh, connected to Internet of Things, to augmented reality. But again, we need, first of all, collect data and treat it like the best way possible. It really is quite mind-boggling, just all of the possibilities that yeah. are out there. It's just endless, isn't it? To think of all the ways in which technology can have such a positive impact on the fan experience. I would love to circle back for a moment about how mental health, once again, kind of plays a role in this, because as Mike was pointing mm. out, when you're at a stadium, sometimes you're celebrating, you're cheering, you're joyful, you're excited mm. with what you're watching, but sometimes you go so. from the highest highs to the lowest lows. Mm. So how can tech be used to try and help manage some of those stress levels and to actually flip the script into making it something more enjoyable again? Yeah, it's, it's wonderful, isn't it? So I think that the opportunity that we have is to firstly, watching uh, sport as a fan can be stressful, right? Yes. Because of what we're talking about. <laughs> so you're, you're with it. So how can we take the, the other stressors away from the fan experience? We just talked about, you know, going to queue to get some food. We want to know how long the queue, little technologies out there to help people moving, right? Can I leave the stadium through that gate or this gate? So there's ways that you can make your uh, entry to the stadium and exit from the stadium a little bit less stressful. So your overall stress, your allostatic load on your nervous system is just the sport and not, am I going to get home? Is there going to be any transport? All of these things. I'm really hungry. I'm a vegetarian. There's only burgers left. Or whatever it might be. They've got all these things. If you can remove the stress from those other, you know, movable parts, then you can be at one with the sporting adventure, right? Because it's going to be an experience on your nervous system. But also we have the opportunity to inspire, right? Uh, and, and educate as well. So it's like, as Mostly was just saying, you know, there's downtime, oh, I'm going to use my phone to learn more about that player or this. Or if you're watching a sport, like at the Olympic Games, and maybe if all goes well, this, this you know, part of the world will get to host the world's greatest event, all of those sports, all of those nations. And there's an education part. I'm sitting there watching table tennis or archery, and I've got no idea what's going on. We've got the opportunity to educate people as well, to give them the chance to be in. So technology can be used in that way to inspire, to educate, but also from a mental health health point of view, you know, to educate people on, if you're sitting there and you're starting to feel overwhelmed, here's a breathing exercise. Look on your phone. There's this something called diaphragmatic nasal breathing. Just breathe a little bit deeper into your belly when you're feeling like amped up in a high stakes game. And then you've got this opportunity. You come back from a sporting event going, hey, I've got this thing where I've managed to calm my nervous system down and have a great time and get the food I wanted. And I got home safely and I took my family. I'm doing it again. And technology can assist us in all of those things. So it's this multi-layered approach where we're interacting seamlessly between the technology that we all have anyway, but the opportunity that we have as hosts, as stadium hosts, is to educate our audience, to get them to keep coming back and feel safe and welcome and that sense of belonging, because that's the most powerful thing, isn't it? Anything? Anybody wants to add on a particular note? Uh, well, I, I think uh, the, the sense of belonging in, in that one, and it almost as if uh, 
it should be a public space, right? Mm -hmm. A stadium mm -hmm. should be like a park or a place that we can that we can go at any time. Sometimes there's a concert in the park, sometimes there's a game at the stadium, but it's a public space because then it becomes something that is for all of us mm. in the city and, and we can come anytime we want. Oh, right? You read sense. my mind because this is exactly where I wanted to take the conversation. So thank you, that was quite okay. a, a beautiful transition <laughs> for me. I don't know if any of you have seen FC Barcelona as an example, what they're trying to do with this Spy Barca. Any fans of FC Barcelona here? You know what I'm talking about, right, my man? <laughs> so it's quite revolutionary. They call it Espai Barca, which means Barca space, and they call it more than a stadium. I love this. A space where anything is possible, a place to experience new ways of enjoying sport and entertainment, strengthening inclusion, one of the things we were talking about, and integration with the neighborhood. It's groundbreaking. It's innovative. It's creating a space beyond just the arena itself. So Mimi, how do you, when you're designing an incredible space like this, how do you find that delicate balance of maintaining cultural identity, heritage, not just of the club, but of the city itself, of the people itself, of the social side of things? I'm so glad that you mentioned culture because I was just thinking when, when Leon was speaking, I, I hope I get asked a question where I can find an answer about culture. Because listening to you, Leon, just then reminds me, I've watched more sport. I, in fact, I'm not sure I've ever watched sport in my home country. I've watched more sport in countries that are arguably not my home. And I think culture plays such a massive, has such a massive impact on how we experience those spaces. So what will be very interesting about Barca is to look at how much is made for people of Barcelona, for the actual Spaniards who live there and you know, have supported that club for four, four generations. <laughs> versus a global audience because they want to be the best and they want to innovate and they, you know, they want social media coverage and viral content and all of those wonderful things that, that is marketing, is fundamentally marketing. I think for me, the key to that design is finding those spaces in that environment, back to belonging, where people can feel connected to their sport as well as each other. We know that globally, 52% of people are lonely, and loneliness is the highest burden on our healthcare systems worldwide. Yeah. So people think that it's cancer or heart disease or diabetes, but it's loneliness that is tanking our healthcare system. So when you look at these amazing beyond the stadium spaces, of course it's about the sport and of course it's about the team, but exactly to your point there, how is it about culture? How is it about connecting us? How are we designing those spaces yeah to enable those connections beyond the, in this case, the field that we're focusing on. So I think there is a huge social impact that these stadiums can have if that is embedded in that thinking. And of course, here in the kingdom, they're doing it from scratch today. So they can build platforms and opportunities to connect Saudi, yes, to the world, but maybe more importantly, to connect Saudi to themselves in a whole new way. And they have perhaps some wonderful examples to look at. You already mentioned the Santiago Bernabeu, for example, which has recently been remodeled. You have Spurs Stadium uh, that is just unbelievable state of the art, one of the best in the world, the SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles, for example. So how do you actually merge this kind of state of the art, trailblazing style development of these stadiums while at the same time kind of integrating and Preserve. and preserving all of that yeah uh, you know what it's it's very tricky it's very tricky um in brazil back there in 2013 we had a very good example of it uh well we hosted the um, the fifa world cup in 2014 but until until 13 Basically, all stadiums in Brazil were the type of old school stadiums. And for some reason that I cannot understand, uh, the fans were proud to be at the stadium, struggling to have an experience. Barely, they, could, they couldn't barely see the pitch, but they are proud to be there saying, we are the real fans, mm. you know? Including the media used to say the same. So authenticity, it sounds like, is a really yeah. core element of yeah. this. Yeah. And so they, are, they, they were proud of it. But then the, the FIFA World Cup came, and the stadiums just became a different thing. 
So now those fans are complaining. They are still complaining because they say, for example, the legendary Maracanã, they say it's not the same Maracanã. Mm. Uh, it it uh, lost its soul. Ah. This is impressive. But obviously, the experience nowadays is completely different. In my opinion, it's better. But they say, is the stadium uh, built for TV spectators mm -hmm. who are now paying expensive tickets to be there to attend the, those matches, you know? So uh, I would say, in a long term, the, the, the solution will, will, will come. But in a short term, I would say, OK, let's solve that. I think, uh, as you mentioned already, we have to balance the heritage and like maybe we need to pre, pre to preserve a grandstand we need to pre i don't know to to preserve an arch or something an arch or something and highlight that you know like say hey we are doing that we we know our history mm -hmm. and I, I am not just saying about the stadium the club itself i'm talking about the city the neighborhood mm -hmm. as you mentioned before mm -hmm. so i think the the engineers the architects should find this balance between technology and the, 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 the new designs. And um, also, I think it's important when they are finding this, this, this right solution is to not divide people, not to, to say, okay, now you, you are the, the, the new type of fan, you are totally into technology and you are welcome here. But you, you are more, more old-fashioned, so you are not welcome. And it, it doesn't exist. You know, it, it's, it's not, it's not well, uh, it's, it's not the, the, the right way to work. So, as I said, it's tricky. Yeah. There maybe there is not the, the exactly the right answer, but I think I'll, I would suggest that. It's quite hard to make everyone happy from different generations combining local fans with global fans. I mean, it is quite tricky, and it's, it's yeah. fascinating as well to see how clubs and sports are currently working this process out. And talking about legacy a little bit, I think one of the major sporting events that is struggling a little bit with all of this and the legacy that it leaves behind in, in cities in a wider sense is the Olympic Games. Perhaps you can say something about this as well, Leon. Obviously, a lot of people want to host it because of what it represents, the history, the, the sense of pride, and it is just a wonderful sporting event for so many different reasons, yet whenever the games are finished, they have a very hard time making good use of a lot of the facilities. So how can cities or countries look to major sporting events such as the Olympic Games as a way of trying to figure out how can we get the communities more involved? How can there be a proper legacy project? How can people make good use of what has been built by the games? Yeah, that's, I mean, there are amazing people working on this uh, in, in the world, right? City, city planners are for sure uh, heroes in some level in my life. Uh, so how they are really trying to, pro to, to project what's going to happen, you know, in the future of, uh, of all the things that are being built. Um, but uh, so in a sense, I will leave that. But I think that, not leave it, but I think that it's, it's an early entry point that we need to have uh, all of us to to get into when it comes to sports, right? Mm. I mean, in a, in, a, in a sense, if we all close our eyes, we can we can imagine and we can hear the ocean, right? Mm. And the same, we can we can hear the forest, we can hear the wind, right? Can we also hear the stadium, right? Is a mm. stadium a place that we already, from a very young age, can feel as a place that is feels at home, that feels safe, and feels amazing to be in, right? So in that sense, I think that starting, starting early, because then all of these spaces will be, in a sense, spaces we will use also not on game days. And I think that's the, uh, the whole thing, and that's, I think, what so many people are working on right now. I like that, because there is a reason why in English we refer to a lot of football grounds in particular as hallowed ground. As right. Uh, as a cathedral in a way and in, in homage to the sports and to the players, the, to the fans, to everybody that, that convenes, that converges to have this, this wonderful experience collectively. I don't know if there's anything that you would like to add in particular. Yeah, so with the, with the Olympic Games, what we've seen is, is it's so difficult to host such a grand event and then end up with what are called you know, white elephants where stadia aren't used. And what London did particularly well is they regenerated a whole area of London which needed help. 
They built stadiums uh, that were going to be converted. So the Aquatic Center is a great example of beautiful architectural design, beautiful flow waves, a really conscious effort on the flow of people onto the Olympic Park, which is now the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, which is now much greener than it used to be. This whole area has been converted. But the Aquatic Center, I, you know, I was in there commentating, and there was uh, eight, swimming as well. yeah, <laughs> eighteen thousand people there. Uh, you know, when it was Olympic Games time, but of course, we're never going to fill it again after the games go. So it was in converted into legacy mode. Now it's a three thousand seater that anyone in the local community can swim for less than five pounds, which is hardly anything when you think. So it was this kind of like, how is this going to impact on this sense of community post event? Because in that lane that I swam in a few times, that's where Michael Phelps and all these amazing swimmers. In. And then young children could get to do the same, and then you've got that impact that sport unites us. And that's why we're all so excited about hosting major sporting events, because it brings the world together. It's far greater than the activity itself, right? It unifies the Olympic Games is probably the greatest example of that, and we got to watch it, Olympic Games, Paralympic Games, for all of those reasons, right? So this needs to be celebrated, but it also needs to be sustainable in a way where it then gets handed back to the community. Here you go, Tower Hamlets of London. You've got a kick-ass aquatic centre now that you could go and learn to swim in. You could take the family, the grandparents can go, and you can host different events there, and it's a space to be utilised every single day. Mm. not just for three weeks of a four-year cycle or for an extra two weeks with the, with the Paralympics when the spotlight is upon that city. And London still revels in its hosting of the Olympic Games because of the legacy. It's easy to find holes, but generally speaking, the legacy piece has been really powerful. And I think that's what we can continue, as, as Mike had just said. There's smart people working on this. Let's listen to them and then let's keep it rolling. London certainly has been a success story whenever it comes to the Olympic Games. I love your enthusiasm. It's a great way for us to end things. We do have just a few more minutes. I would love to open up the floor in just a moment. I'll give you all an opportunity to think about any questions that you would like to pose to our wonderful panelists. In the meantime, very quickly, just go down the row here. Any final words, any final thoughts you would like to share with our wonderful audience? Well. I will have Please. one, and that's just because I asked uh, some of the women playing in our tournaments and saying, what would they say? So uh, if their experience on stage, and they would say, uh, make it uh, sound-wise accessible for them to be there with kids, also like little babies and, and small ones. So mm -hmm. instead of having to put things on them, that you could have an area where the sound was not so massive, uh, and then that they could bring their own food. Okay, interesting. So that was, uh, like. Well, you can speak to learning, the Spanish. They love to bring the their boca de de jamón. Anyone else? Final thoughts? Uh, yeah, I'd like to add uh, just a comment about the fan experience again. I mean, uh, I tried to highlight the concept of fan experience. Obviously, we can spend the night here talking about different technologies, like, I don't know, sound systems, uh, big screens or whatever. Uh, but Again, uh, I just wanted to say, I mean, we are here talking about stadiums. The stadium is a huge part of the fan experience. But the fan experience it starts before and ends after the stadium. So it's important to have this mindset of the fan experience. And uh, when I say fan experience, I'm not talking about, I know, a VIP guest who is able to see the players coming and coming in and coming out. I'm talking about everyone. Who is, who is there attending a match, you know? So if we have this mindset, the stadium is kind of a consequence. So we are gonna like build a, a great stadium, a, a great major sport event with this mindset. Love it. It's really important and nice to remember that stadiums are very much part of the fabric of, of any city, any society, any culture. Anyone have any questions that they would like to ask at this time? Don't be shy. <laughs> there we go. Can we get a microphone over to this gentleman, please? Oh, I think it's not turned on. Yeah. Uh, my question to Miss uh, Gil Martin. She mentioned uh, that uh, the stadium should be in a public place. Uh, Gdea Stadium, for example, uh, what do you think about it? 
So are you saying being a public place? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that the, the, the way that they are uh, located in many places are they're fairly easy access and you could play with that. So again, so the experience from going for your, from your home to, to uh, the, the, the stadium place could even be a playful, the closer I get, the more I have to be physically active. I mean, there could be so many ways of playing up into the stadiums. But then I think going in and just, you know, lying on the grass watching the stars or, or doing your step trainings up and down the stairs or just go and simply uh, have a moment with yourself, that it becomes a space like a church in the sense where you can just come in and, and just be yourself. The space is so big that you like often can have that space, right? Spiritual. Yeah, like so spiritual. make it a special and special for people, not just special for, for the, sure. not just, but special for the players sure. as they are. Sure. And I think the energy, sure. if you move I, the energy the away from the players a little bit, right, it'll yeah. give the players a little more breathing room to be them, that, that it's all, also a little bit focused on the, on the fans. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Anyone else? Right here in the front, loving the red shoes. Hi, uh, how, how are the conversations with those football teams going, for example, for these like public spaces? Because I, I come from Munich, we have a beautiful stadium with Allianz Arena, but it's kind of like a high security area, basically, right? Like mm -hmm. it's basically, you can only go in, I think, if you have like a VIP ticket or something like that. So I think I love your idea of, have, of opening this up, but the question is how do you kind of like convince maybe even like football teams to see this as like commercial opportunity, because it's kind of interesting. I feel like most stadiums are only used for football, maybe like a music concert, but most of the time they're not used at all. There are a ton of security there. You're not allowed to go to the pitch, right? But I think a lot of people who visit this country, like for example, if they would come to Kedia and so on, they would probably would love this experience, like you said. I, I love that idea, actually, of kind of like walking around, making pictures and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe on the pitch were like an important, um, tournament has been played? So I think that we definitely see it. I mean, uh, Levi Stadium, as you mentioned before, they, they have, they, I think that they have about like 300 kids coming in through the stadium every day. So at least they have the logistics of opening up the place and then they do these learning sessions. So I, 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 we definitely see it. And of course, you need to work with the, the, both with the stadiums and the clubs for it to be open, or maybe it's only parts of it that are open. But, but uh, women's sports where I am mostly focused so uh, so you have places stadiums where there's like 25,000 people st you know spectators coming in that where they want to have that approach to the female fans in a sense so I think that we will we will definitely see it I think <laughs> I hope <laughs> yeah thank you very much for the question yeah thank you and we have time just for one more if anybody out there would like to feel the final question no, everyone good? Okay, sure, why not? <laughs> Two for the price of one. Yeah, we're, in 2025, we're bringing the um, Olympic esports games to Riyadh, basically bring the Olympics into video games. Obviously, complete new concept, new industry, you can say. Maybe I have some ideas how we can do that, how we can bring sort of like the Olympic movement into video games. Obviously, esports is a huge thing already in the sports world. But wait, basically, we have this kind of like unique challenge of bringing the sort of like bridging the traditional sports world with the digital one. Yeah, well, I, I, it's really interesting isn't it? because um, as uh, you can see the Olympic Games, Paralympic Games, as they evolve and we start to see the increase in, uh, in new uh, sports, which have always been there. You know, the examples are skateboarding, surfing. These were only sports a few decades ago that were X Games and such like. So what we're doing is we're bringing in a wider population. You know, the world is a lonely place without heroes, right? And so if you're accomplished at something, and it means you've, you don't happen to be Olympian or Paralympian or an, an elite athlete by accident, there's a road that you've been to. And I think that we need to start shining a, um, a spotlight brightly on those who are you know, doing you know, and, and excelling in those areas. And also as the technology advances and esports starts to get more and more fan base, that it's a big bringing those into the family as well in the right way at the right time. So I think it's thriving in its own side at the moment. And I think there will be a point in the future where it comes a little bit more clearly how these 
worlds, if you like, or realms, or however you want to start to describe them, start to slot in nicely as the technology advances and as the fans start to drive through their demand by the viewing figures and the demand what they want to see. So I find it really interesting from my sporting background, where it's almost traditionally, oh, these are the Olympic sports that, you know, and then eventually start to go, oh, yeah, well, that's cool. That should be in. And in fact, everyone should be in and start opening up, but then realizing that the games can only last two and a half weeks. So we've got to be reasonably strict on what it is we're doing. But I find it fascinating how you know it's engaging with the public and the fans, and we've got to listen to our fans and what they want and respond accordingly. So as soon as that starts to raise, then I think a point in the future there will be that uh, joining of forces, and I'm interested to see how that unfolds. But I have no idea how that would be. I would, Good I would just add one thing as well. I think that there's a real education process to happen because I can't speak on behalf of all parents, but I can speak on behalf of a fair few, that we're quite scared of what that means for our children because there is this assumption that to become a, an e-sport Olympian, whatever the right term is, that means that that child has sat in a dark bedroom for you know, 1,000 hours playing a computer game and never leaving their room and not being with their friends and all those fear factors that come from parenting in the modern world and, and the internet. So, I think there is so much phenomenal growth and, and resilience that is coming from these new athletes that parents and perhaps the mass public don't know about. So I think there's an education to be done so that people don't feel that this is not really, you know, they, they just play games, right? And until we crack that, until we're able to educate the public, and it will take time, that they're not just doing anything they are succeeding and winning and achieving in their own right, which is what, of course, all athletes do in their own right. I think that there's a, some storytelling to be done to really enable mass uptake. So I would say that that's something we have to look at how to do that as well. Yeah, because being in a dark room and not moving is not good for human beings to thrive and to grow, is it? So there's uh, the education piece, is the balance, you know, human first, you know, getting outside, getting fresh air, eating well, and then allocating time to your passions is a healthy way of doing it, whatever domain you're in. And I yeah. think that's a great point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you for the questions. Mike and Leon, Mimi, Wes, thank you very much. You've been outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to the audience as well for being here with us. We really appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. Oh, I guess I've been cut off. That's it. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> they're kicking us off. Thank you. Anyway, thank, thank you. you so much.